Good afternoon and welcome back to the Azapu Online Political Education Platform. And uh, my name is Simpiwa Ashe. I am here this afternoon with you to talk about gender-based violence. But the focus of today's discussion is really on the unspoken side of gender-based violence. We have had a number of times in the last couple of months, um, you know, the country so engulfed in discussion about what to do about gender-based violence. Uh, our you know, country, South Africa, is um, deep in trouble with the pandemic, dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. But you know, the more secondary pandemic that we have been dealing with as a country is really you know, the scourge of gender-based violence. And uh, the focus has really been um, you know, gender-based violence in so far as it impacts and affects, you know, women and, and children. Uh, but now the question is, uh, what about men? What about those men who are seen as victims of violence in the domestic front, who are seen as victims of gender-based violence in their relationships? I am here today with um, a scholar in the space of gender-based violence in Dr. Tswaledi Tobejan, who is currently an associate professor within the Institute for Gender and Youth Studies at the University of Venda. He obtained his master's of science degree in community development at the Southern New Hampshire State University in 1998 and went on to study for his doctoral degree in international education at the University of Massachusetts in the USA. And he's presently coordinating a gender unit in the Faculty of Humanities, Social Sciences, and Education at the University of Venda. Uh, Dr. Tovejane has authored three books in the area of politics, but more, uh, and more than 30 articles which were published in peer reviewed journals. And he's also an executive uh, committee member of our um, Azapo Limpopo uh, province. Welcome to this uh, platform, Professor Tovejan. It's, it's great to have you here talking about, you know, what I call the unspoken side of gender-based violence. Oh, th thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I hope you can hear me, Ndate. I can, I can hear you uh, loud and clear. And oh, what, you know, even before we do anything is, is to give you an opportunity to just reflect on 
you know, gender-based violence in general, and also just give us your perspective of, um, you know, the, the unspoken side of gender-based violence and so far as it impacts on, you know, um, men, what I call the muted men who are uh, affected and impacted by yeah. gender violence. Mm -hmm. no, thank you. And uh, I also would like to thank uh, the participants who are part of this uh, webinar. Uh, let me first of all say that uh, uh, I, I should thank Azapo for highlighting the issues of gender-based violence uh, because many people are just paying lip, lip service to, to the issue of gender-based gender violence. Unfortunately, it is engulfing the entire country and uh, I, I'm very grateful that uh, Azapo has taken it upon itself to, to talk about it. Now, let me, before I can talk about the muted men who are suffering at the hands of their spouses, so to say, <laughs> let me just generally talk about uh, the fact that in, in pre-colonial Africa, we've had queens who ruled uh, countries. Uh, people would remember Queen Nefertiti in Egypt. People will remember uh, Queen Nzinga and uh, here at home, the mother of Chaka, uh, who was very, very strong and powerful and leading uh, the Zulu nation. And uh, you will also remember Queen Mujaji uh, here in Limpopo, who was also a, a fierce leader and, and uh, a defender of the rights of women and men. So the, the issue of gender discrimination, uh, many scholars have attested to the fact that uh, it came with, uh, 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 I mean, if you read people like Angels and so on, uh, the origin of the family, Angels will tell you that uh, the family was the beginning of a class society where a woman was seen to be property for for the men. And some other Marxist scholars uh, would also say that uh, women were reduced to uh, just mere laborers at home instead of being equal to men. We have also seen the advent of feminist movements that tried to address the issue of gender-based violence and gender discrimination. So now coming back to South Africa, uh, we know that uh, our country is a, it's a capitalist country and uh, gender-based violence is a twin evil of the system of capitalism, which thrives on uh, exploitation of people. So if you see what I call uh, uh, patriarchal capitalism, where patriarchy being a system which denigrates women, uh, that kind of a system bodes very well with capitalism because capitalism for it to thrive has to have cheap labor and people who are women uh, uh, fit into that mode of cheap labor. So ultimately, if, if you have to fight and destroy gender-based violence, it means the entire system that we are entrapped in has to be overhauled, has to be changed so that a new system, which Steve Bigo talked about, uh, the system of uh, an egalitarian society. Remember in egalitarianism, we talk of a system which is devoid of sexism, gender-based violence, uh, oppression and exploitation. So in a nutshell, the system that we are entrapped in is the one that ultimately is responsible for gender-based violence. Now, all these other things can be just mere anecdotal evidence where a man can just hack his woman to death and so on and so forth. But at the core of that violence uh, remains property and, you know, control and ownership. Now, another factor which 
maybe I should talk about, because today we are talking about men who are suffering at the hands of their spouses. Uh, as, as a coordinator of the gender unit at the University of Venda, we went on to do some research. Uh, and mostly the research that we are doing is based on gender-based violence. But you know, as we were going on, we found a cohort of men who were silent, who were trapped in, in, in this cycle of violence perpetrated uh, by their spouses. So we, we said, oh man, what, what should we do about it? Should we be quiet? Because we know that 90% of people who are suffering uh, uh, this gender-based violence are women. But then there are these group of men who are also at the receiving end of, of, of gender-based violence. So we, we, do, we did some research and uh, it was of course a qualitative research design where uh, we went to interview these men and we found that uh, actually there are a lot of men who are suffering in silence in South Africa. Well, I'm not promoting that uh, when they are suffering, they should vent their anger by way of killing their women because uh, gender-based violence, uh, we don't need it regardless of who is committing it. It can be committed by a woman or a man. It's just not all. Uh, so we, we did that study and we found that uh, some of the key factors, it's control, economic control, where if a woman uh, you, you know, uh, moves up the economic ladder, uh, she feels like she, she has control and men because of this machismo, the patriarchal way that we were brought up, uh, we think that if a, if a woman uh, succeeds, uh, they pose a challenge to us. So some of the women inadvertently or advertently so, uh, try to embrace themselves into this patriarchal space where they also act like those men who feel like they can oppress their women because they have the power to do that. So, so it's a vicious cycle where uh, some of these women are actually having what we call uh, you know, hegemonic masculinities. They are very much in control and uh, because they are the breadwinners, they feel like they have taken over the responsibilities of a man. So the ultimate and the findings were that, uh, uh, you, you know, men also have to be listened to uh, in as much as we are promoting shelters for women, we should also try to have a dialogue on a daily basis. And thank you for bringing this up because then it will open up more dialogues in as far as uh, men are concerned. So they too can also benefit uh, if we were to have shelters for, for men, not only for women. Because remember, when we talk of gender, we are not talking of sexes here or biological differences. We are talking of a, a social construct, which says that uh, uh, if uh, gender has to do with the relationship between men and women and how they you know, coexist in the society. It has nothing to do with biological differences. So we can turn this thing around and uh, those patriarchal epithets can be changed so that uh, everybody can ultimately live in peace. Uh, in a nutshell, that's, that's what we found out, uh, sir. You know, that's an interesting finding in terms of the study. But what I'm also uh, realizing from, you know, <clears throat> um, what you are telling me is that in as much as, um, you know, these women are, you know, demonstrating what you call the hegemonic uh, masculinity towards, uh, towards men, it seems to me that it is more of a reaction to their own oppression, to how they've found, uh, you know, this patriarchal society, and they are trying to find a way by which they can coexist with men in, in this, uh, you know, patriarchal world or patriarchal capital world. Um, it, it, 
true that um, you know this is what you may call a negative response coming from these women because you know let's face it society is led by men and men dictate the terms by which uh, you know people live in the society and all of um, you know the nuances that you see and the mannerisms that you see are influenced by how men see the world and they, they, they stereotype how you should be responding to, to the world. And, uh, you know, these women mm -hmm. are seeing this and seeing it as a way of demonstrating their power over the men that um, seem to be weaker than them. Is that, is that, is that your reflection as well? Yes, it is true, sir. It is very true that uh, it's a reaction. It's just a knee-jerk reaction uh, because it is a system. Uh, patriarchal capitalism is a system. So, uh, uh, and men have been taught that they are more valuable in society. Uh, even during customary law, uh, I mean, our customs and so on, for instance, if, if you have a piece of land and uh, you pass on, who will be the inheritor? Obviously, it won't be your daughter. <laughs> it, it, it will be your, uh, your, your son. Uh, uh, so that has been going on for a long time. Uh, and it, it inculcates that sense of worthlessness in a woman. So, so, so that ultimately, when they fight back, uh, it, it appears as if... Uh, they are doing something very bad, whereas they, they are just fighting uh, against the system of patriarchy. Now, remember, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, gender-based violence is also an economic factor. South Africa, between the year 2012 and 2013, lost close to 2.5 billion rands on gender-based violence. Uh, and that actually had a dent on our gross domestic product on, on our GDP. So, so it's also an economic factor which actually stagnates uh, the country in terms of moving forward. Instead of using that money for the benefit of the entire society, shelters are being built and then uh, cases are being opened and the uh, property is being destroyed by those men who are fighting their women. So the, the aggregate, would be that 2.5 billion rent is lost. So that is why it is incumbent on anybody to, to be at the forefront of the struggle against gender-based violence. It shouldn't only be women. We as men have an equal responsibility to, to change the tide, to make sure that uh, 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 this pandemic is, is stopped. Now, we, we also know that uh, uh, you know, Ngujiwa Thiongo talked about a, a post-colonial, uh, 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 you know, discourse where a man does not know where he belongs to. Uh, you know, with the advent of colonialism, we had slavery, we had uh, oppression, we had apartheid in South Africa. So all those factors combined together uh, gives us a, a confused personality <laughs> which resides in this man who mm. advocates gender-based violence. So that also needs us to unravel the nature instead of uh, fighting the symptoms. Let's go to the root causes. You will find that our education system is not geared towards the liberation of women or towards an egalitarian society which B Steve Biko talks about almost uh, if you read his books on a daily basis. So that means our education system is geared towards patriarchal capitalism, towards ownership of property, where a woman is also seen as part of that property. And so if you change the entire system by way of redesigning the educational system in this country, perhaps we can move. We, we can we can have a very big dent on on gender based violence. Mm. You know the interesting thing is that you you speak of uh, you know Gukis, uh, you know post colonial um, you know assertions, and I suppose you can uh, in that um, 
you know, put in other um, other other theories like like Fanon, uh, who also into that space of uh, you know post-colonial identity, and right. and here we are, <laughs> and here we are in this neo-colonial setup. Uh, so this to be with us, uh, you know, um, for some time. And when we generally speak of, uh, you know, gender-based violence, you know, ordinarily, uh, without even asking what you are talking about, people understand you to mean, uh, you know, violence against women. And it's not, it's not so much what you speak about the relationship between, uh, you know, uh, men and me, women in terms of how they coexist together. You know, the interesting thing is that during the you know beginning of the lockdown, you know the first three months of the lockdown uh, last year, 120,000 cases were reported of gender-based violence. Is it a question of people not being able to live together, or they cannot be able to tolerate and coexist together in the same space? Why is it for us as as human beings to you know to cohabit and coexist? in the same space. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an interesting uh, uh, observation that uh, we, we also came across that. We, the recent article that I co-published with some of my colleagues uh, were around the issues of uh, COVID-19 and gender-based violence. And uh, it's not only unique to South Africa, the entire world has witnessed an upset of gender-based violence. I don't know, maybe because people at some stage found themselves locked up and you start to know in the character of your spouse or your husband even more. And you said, Kevin, <laughs> what have I done here? Uh, I have married a beast. So, so mm. now mm. people start fighting and, and all that. So there is an upsurge of, of the level of gender-based violence uh, during lockdown uh, and uh, you are right. Uh, this can be attributed to the fact that people start to know each other and this bullying husband who was not there at home uh, 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 when lockdown was not there uh, starts to exhibit his bullying tactics more often at home. And now the woman realizes that, uh, no, this is not the character that I really wanted to, uh, to marry. But at the same time, uh, I, I don't want to, to belittle the fact that uh, in every second, just like we are speaking now, a, a woman is suffering at the hands of a man. And that's a painful reality. By, by the time this show ends uh, and you go and check statistics around the world, you will find that a lot of women have been maimed, killed, or, uh, or, or you know, subjected to some horrendous uh, uh, you know, punishment by, by, a, by a man. And we also know that uh, recently some, you know, there was this lady who was a student and she was hacked to death, dismembered, her parts were just put into a box. And, you know, that is so painful. I, I don't know where yeah. we got this, uh, uh, you know, even animals don't behave that way except when they are hungry, a lion will kill to feed itself. But then you have this man hacking his wife to death. But in the same breath, you have a woman who was putting some insurance money and you know, benefiting from the death of everybody that she has insured. I'm trying to give you the, the scale of what gender-based mm. violence can look like. It is not only perpetrated by people who have male genitalia. Uh, it can be both ways. So, so, so when we talk about it, it has to be another struggle. And thanks God we have organizations like Imbeleko who are at the forefront of uh, the fight against gender-based violence. Uh, we have black feminists in this country who are at the forefront of this fight. Uh, in the US, you, you, you've had liberal feminists and so on and so forth. But all over the world, you, you have this movement which we should appreciate uh, because they also would like to turn the tables around and make sure that we have a, you know, a, a free society devoid of, of gender-based violence. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you know, what I would like to, to hear from you is how should men be responding to these things? Because you know what 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 you tell yeah is that let, let's let, let's take an analogy of of you know the two stories that you have you have just narrated of uh, you know this uh, student from the University of Fortel was cut into pieces and put into a box, and now you have. Um, take a similar situation where a man would have been cut into pieces and put into the same box. How how would South Africa be responding to that? Yeah, expect the same kind of response that you saw when that uh, student was put into the box. And why 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 would the I, why would the response be different, if any? Mm. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a very that's a very difficult question. Uh, but but you know, and that's why when we talk of gender, we move beyond the biological differences and we embrace mm-hmm. the, so, the social construct and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, for me, if if what we call hegemonic masculin- masculinities can be fought, because in women. Uh, we, we could have some women who are uh, stronger and exhibit hegemonic masculinities. And in men, we can have a man who has a feminine mas- masculinities, who is not prone to fighting and all that. So, so rather than looking at men and women, we, we would rather face gender-based violence, regardless of who is the victim? Uh, because mm. like you rightly say, if a man could have been hacked to death by a woman, would we be silent? No, uh, it is still gender-based violence uh, uh, perpetrated by a woman in this instance. So, so yeah. uh, and that is why uh, uh, our study found that some men are in the closet. They are afraid of crying out loud because if they do that, they will be seen as less of men. Remember, even in some languages, um, we do have languages that are wrote in patriarchal epithets. Uh, uh, in Susutu, for instance, we have so many. Meaning a man shouldn't cry. And uh, even in Venda, even in English, we do have such epithets that are uh, uh, engendering, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, mis- misogyny, so to say. Yeah, uh, that yeah. is the rule of men over women. So, mm. so it means even our language has to evolve from what we know. It means a man is an ex. He can chop as many trees. Uh, he can chop as many trees as he can. <laughs> as he can, <laughs> yeah. So now, uh, where does this leave a woman? Uh, I mean, probably a woman may be uh, many trees that can be chopped by several axes. I don't know. If we turn that around, uh, will it still be okay for us men? Uh, so, so at some stage, there has to be a balance where gender has to be uh, addressed equally so. Uh, We have gender commission in South Africa. What is it doing? Um, We have had so many commissions on gender, but apparently we are just paying lip service. We can pump a lot of money into those commissions and write beautiful policies. But at the end of the day, we have to face the reality that it is our education system that also perpetuates gender-based violence. Uh, and uh, it means the overhauling of our socioeconomic and cultural order in South Africa. Now, you, you mentioned, you know, interestingly, the, the, the concept of language and, uh, you know, how we define terms. Because, I mean, if, for instance, we go back to our original analogy, um, when, uh, you know, that University of Forte student is hacked to death, uh, you know, we called that gender-based violence. But if it was a man, we wouldn't be talking about gender-based violence, we'll be talking about murder. And, and we'll divorce completely from, from gender-based violence. How do we change the narrative in terms of language, in terms of definition? Because largely society 
is led by men. And these men are put into those positions of leadership by women. And uh, it, is, it is these women who are more comfortable with, with these uh, definitions. So we need to begin a, a process of re-education, as you say. But what do we, do we need to do to entrench a, a, a re-education program? Starting from the language, starting from you know, the relations, the other issues that you mentioned. Yeah, no, that, that's, that, that, that's very uh, true. Uh, uh, and uh, these languages, they are spoken almost in a, on a daily basis. Uh, when guys are, you know, sitting over a glass of beer, uh, 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 some kind of a patriarchal nuance can be just dropped there and then, and, and no one will take offense to that. We seem to have lost uh, connection with uh, Professor Swade Itobejani. Um, whilst is um, reconnecting back with us, you're more than welcome to engage in this conversation with us uh, by dropping your questions on the Q&A and the chat, as well as um, you know, raise your hand and uh, participate in this conversation. This is a conversation that is very topical and it impacts on all of us. And um, you know, the solutions to this, I think uh, they uh, reside in all of us. Uh, let's contribute to the dialogue and um, contribute to the conversation. And uh, maybe we can come up with um, some suggestions on how uh, you know, society can move forward in this, in this discussion. And um, here's uh, David Musset. Hi, David. Good afternoon, colleagues. Hi, good, good afternoon, colleagues. I can hear you. Make your oh. contribution whilst we are dealing with that. Hello. I Hello. can hear you, David. Sure. Sure. That's David Musata from Peter Dambuza Foundation. Uh, I just want to ask quickly one question regarding the case of uh, this uh, former constable uh, Naomi Lovu where you find that uh, she has got a case behind of killing many people, but uh, we don't see women marching against that activity. So you start to ask yourself, is if people are to talk about gender-based violence, how about that case? As there've been a lot of people who have been killed. I rest my case, thank you. Uh, sorry, David, um, I was dealing with the Professor here. So your question is, uh, with all of these people who are being killed, and um, can you can you just repeat that by me? By the way, I was referring to a situation whereby a woman is involved in killings. Uh, yeah. you, uh, uh, all these other associations or organizations, they don't make noise about it. It is exactly, if, if I may, um, if I may engage with a question, um, it is exactly what I was talking about earlier, uh, that, you know, when um, a woman hacks a man to death, it's not seen as gender-based violence, and which is why you will not see many organizations marching, which is why we, you will not see uh, many, um, uh, you know, women organizations marching against that because they don't understand it to be gender-based violence. They understand it to be murder, and they understand it to be part of the norm in our society. Okay, because what we tend to see often is that we, we see people dying every day in this country. We see di people dying every day in Africa, in the world. And um, we see that as a matter for the police to attend to. And if it was a woman who was uh, killed in that manner, we will all jump up and down, and we will all, uh, you know, name call, the, you know, that uh, that man, and you know, all of us, men included, would be calling that man a dog. You know, what 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 do we do with this dog? Forgetting that the people uh, who are also involved in this, I don't know whether you will also call a woman who does the same thing a dog. But it is in the nature in which how we have socialized each other or in, 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 in the manner in which how, um, you know, so, society is understood. 
I'm not sure if I'm I'm responding to to you appropriately. Yes, I totally agree with you. Okay, uh, I'm trying to get um, uh, solidly back uh, on this conversation. Just give me a moment uh, whilst I I try to reconnect him back. <laughs> Welcome back, uh, Professor Tobajan, and uh, it's good to have you back. Uh, whilst we um, had disconnected, uh, um, David was asking a question. Maybe you may uh, be able to offer an opinion on this. And he's asking why it is that when a woman um, you know, cuts a man to pieces and puts that man into a box, you don't see uh, many women organizations and many organizations in society uh, marching against uh, that woman? Oh, yeah, that, that's an interesting oh. question. Um, I, uh, and I'm also against uh, that notion. And thanks, David, for, for, the, for the question. I, I think uh, it is because of the statistics that I've alluded to earlier. Uh, if you have close to 99% of the victims being women, uh, it, it, it overshadows some of those uh, actions that we see. It also overshadows the cohort that I talked about of those men who are actually at the receiving end of gender-based violence. Uh, I think it's, it's injustice. I, I think uh, the media also has to, uh, to raise issues like that, irrespective of one's uh, biological makeup. Uh, if a man is hacked to death, uh, we should equally raise our voices and, uh, and make sure that justice is done. Uh, I fully agree with you. Uh, uh, the media can be very lopsided, uh, uh, but at the same time, I think uh, men also should be at, at the forefront of, of, of you know, trying to raise their voices when GBV escalates against them. Mm. No, no, thanks for that. Um, a couple of comments are coming through thick and fast. And, um, you know, I think this one from uh, Dr. Metzing relates to the question that we're talking about. Uh, in fact, the question that you've just addressed now. Um, and she's saying, um, you know, that's a good question. I think society has tendencies of normalizing the abnormal and not looking at Act, but the gender that did the act. I think society has constructed a concept of categorizing wrongdoing according to gender and not looking necessarily uh, at the act and uh, that can be problematic. And yes, uh, saying, you know, it's true that 
when we talk gender-based violence, we concentrate on women, and this is done generally as it is assumed that women are of um, a weaker sex. But truth be told, men, many men suffer you know, gender-based violence, and we need to teach our society that when we talk issues of gender, we are talking about both um, men and women, as well as transgender and all the LGBT, LGBTQI+. Plus. Um, but be, um, be that as it may, the reason why the society is, is not regarding uh, gender-based violence against men as matter is because women feel the need to bring it to the fore uh, that the majority of cases under GBV are perpetrated against women. And until elements of patriarchy are dealt with, women will forever feel a need to raise the issue of GBV. Is it true that the majority of GBV cases are against women? Or is it largely due to the under-reporting of um, gender-based violence on men? Um, because, I mean, if you look at what you were talking about earlier, the fact that, uh, you know, if a man goes to the police station, for instance, to report that, you know, my wife has, uh, you know, abused me in this way or that way. And, and in any case, uh, all of those men that you see uh, reporting cases at the police station, it largely comes as a, as a response. Uh, for instance, that is coming in the form of a a man who has responded to an abuse uh, to that woman and uh, or from that woman uh, or there was a fight domestic uh, fight at, at at home and then the man gets arrested and then he opens a counter uh, to that because you you are opening a case against me i'm also opening a case against you more often than not the cases that you hear reported are those type of uh, counter cases and not so much a man marching to a police station to say, well, I'm here to report that I'm being abused. And as soon as he ends at the police station, he gets laughed at. Uh, you know, what is the extent of under-reporting from the research studies that you have done? Mm. Well, th there has been a lot of under-reporting, especially by men, um, because of, of this culture of uh, masculinities. Uh, if you are a man, and you have been thrashed by your spouse and you go to, <laughs> to the police station to say, hey, I've been heavily beaten. You, uh, the, the police will either look at you uh, with suspicion that you are not man enough because uh, you really, you cannot be beaten by a woman. Uh, that has happened. Uh, and as a result, you have this closeted men who, who, who are afraid of reporting cases. Uh, and, and sometimes when they report, uh, they, they are told by the police that uh, they should go back home and solve their cases uh, with, with, their, with, their, with their women. I mean, with their... Yes, we seem to have intermittent connection uh, problems with uh, Professor Tsoredi Tobejan. Uh, we're trying to sort that out. And uh, in the meantime, uh, he has... Um, uh, somebody who wants to make a contribution. I don't know who this is. And uh, Professor Tevijana will be with us shortly. Mm. Okay, you can make your contribution in the meantime. Uh, am, I, am I on the platform now? Yes. Yeah, no, no. I, I think um, my name is Ben Mpafele. Yes. I think the, the biggest issue that actually is confronting <laughs> us here is that uh, there, there is need for men to be able to come together somehow and confront the issue of gender-based violence against men. You know, and, and, and you'd find that basically there is need for a quite a serious kind of a, a, a research about how men are actually um, burning within their own families. Immediately when a woman's children are reach a particular age, then a man in the family is seen as something that is of no value. And, mm. and, and this is common. I mean, all of us who are talking now, probably we have an experience one way or another of what I'm saying. So, so, so there is need for a way in which we can begin to balance this. And that's number one. Secondly, the way 
gender-based violence has actually been, uh, or the gender issues, sometimes you actually even feel that maybe it was a mistake that you are upon a man. Because you're so ostracized, even when you are innocent outside there, that there is this particular issue about gender that you need to be, you know, you need to feel somehow as in feel that that is that is an abuse in itself, you know, a, a societal abuse of some kind because you 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 basically perceive as a misfit in society because you are a man. So, so yeah. I think the whole thing of gender is highly unbalanced. It, it, it actually moves to a particular sector of a particular gender against the other one. And, and mm. that balance can only happen when men come together to begin to confront this. this. And research is the way to start. Mm. Mm. Look, I mean, I, I hear you, um, Pasele, but uh, how, how do we resolve it? Uh, because, I mean, men have been coming together and uh, it, it was, um, you know, part of that package of defining what the problem is that um, men saw it uh, fit uh, that uh, we must confront gender-based violence. And in their conceptualization of gender-based violence, it is that gender-based violence speaks to really women violence or, or, or violence against women and not so much about uh, you know, gender issues. So why is it that men cannot um, redefine and reconceptualize the whole uh, aspect and notion of gender-based violence to speak about the relationship that exists between uh, you know, men and women and their core relationship? I've just tabled the motion in other words. Yeah. I've just tabled the motion to say, I think we should redefine the problem statement uh, and okay. begin to do a thorough research in terms of why men are silent when these things are actually happening. And then you unearth a quite a substantial, and, and I've just said that all of us who are participating here who are men, one way mm. or another, they are suffering this thing, and we don't see the suffering. We, 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 we as, 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 as Dimo has already said that, you know, if you go to a police station and say you're ostracized in this particular way, they look at you and say, hey, hey, hey. And, 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 and it is, it is the, it is the, it is the, the inclination by society that men would never suffer something like, and that's not true. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to. I the want same, to. The same way that in the past, when the woman was to say, "I was raped," I'm yeah. raped, and then they would say, "What were you wearing?" You understand? Uh -huh. And then most uh -huh. of the women kept quiet. Now the same thing is happening currently. That men should find the way in which they begin to say, "Here it is. Let us begin to look in this particular way to normalize issues." Mm, mm, mm. I, I just want to check with Dr. Metzing from a psychoanalysis uh, perspective. How should men deal with the situation? Because where you are basically ostracized, it doesn't matter where you go, it doesn't matter what you do, nobody believes you. Uh, is, is this not the kind of a situation that leads to uh, you know, potential suicides? Uh, largely because uh, men feel ostracized and they feel rejected by society and because no one wants to listen to, you know, their suffering. And yet um, they seem to be suffering more than uh, the women that we, we are all fighting uh, for with regards to, you know, this violence that is perpetrated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Yeah, the floor, Dr. Metzin. Thank you so much, Asim uh, I initially uh, sent a message to ask Prof. Uh, we, as a society, my thinking is we have somehow normalized the abnormal. We are looking at who did the act and not necessarily what was the act. And for me, that can be problematic. And I think as, as a society and as women, just like we expect men to stand up and say, not in my name, 
as women, we should also accept and acknowledge that we are also perpetrators of, perpetrators of, of violence, whether it can be actively or passively, but we need to acknowledge and get into the conversation and be part of the conversation also. My thinking mm -hmm. is that a, most of the men are suffering and I, I, I just wanted Prof to maybe to give us like a heads up on to what is the definition of violence? If violence is, uh, can violence, my question also would be, can violence also be silent? And uh, if violence is also about power, then probably violence can also be silent. And my thinking is, you know, as women, sometimes we've got a way of getting power. And that is where, many men are very quiet about it. For example, when a, man, when a woman denies a man, let me say, for example, his conjugal rights and mm. act on a silent treatment or demeaning, is this denying act or this demeaning act, this silent treatment, is it to gain power? And if it's to gain power, is it violence? Well, therefore, by doing that which we are doing, which is not everybody can talk about it, not many men can talk about what I'm talking about. Uh, for, for a man to succumb and give the power back to the woman, uh, just so that the woman can, you know, can feel that status quo. So my point is, this violence is perpetrated by both women and both men. But it's yeah. but it is, society makes it more louder when it's done by men, and it's an unfair thing that we need to correct and women must get into the conversation and acknowledge that they are part of the problem. They also are perpetrators of violence just as much as men. It's just that the, the, the stats are not a true reflection and that's my assertion, are not a true mm. reflection. Many men will not talk about such things mm. that are happening. Mm. Thank you. Uh, thanks you, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Mitzing. Uh, Dr. Tubesha. <clears throat> Oh, thanks, Doc. Uh, I, I, I think you, you, you've said a mouthful. I agree with you 100%. Uh, well, the South African government defines gender-based violence the way you have just defined it, that it can be psychological. Uh, it's, um, I mean, slapping, it, it can be maybe harassment, uh, you know, touching somebody in an... Mm -hmm. uh, uncomfortable way. Uh, so those are forms of, of, of violence. It's not only physical, it can be psychological also. Uh, so so uh, both men and women can suffer the same and uh, no one can be above. But it, it, unfortunately, when you look at the statistics, and that's why we want gender-based violence against women to stop. Because when you look at the statistics, um, uh, it's women who are at the receiving end. Uh, uh. We've lost you again, uh, Dr. Tobejan. Uh, maybe let's give an opportunity to um, another contribution. Um, if we can ask um, uh, sure. to make his contribution. I, I wanted to follow up on, in terms of this issue. Uh, and, and, and I want I want to assert the fact that you see statistics, if the statistics are taken from the administrative register yeah. um, uh, 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 of, of, of the of, of the police or law law enforcement agencies, that is a highly distorted set of numbers. Because I think we need to look at how these deaths have been collected. What is the value chain of the state? And once you once you get into that level, then you begin to say, are we are we asking this, the right kind of question in terms of this issue? Yeah, because and unfortunately, because, and unfortunately, the statistics in this country, you know, in terms of the official protocol, um, is that they are taken from what is reported at the police station. So that, yeah, no, that yeah, that that is definitely. Definitely. That administrative register uh, uh, is, 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 is not really getting deep into the societal issues. 
Um, that is yeah. why I'm saying maybe let's redefine that which we want to do. Because chemically, men um, uh, are driven by, 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 by um, uh, um, a, a different uh, chemical systems that, yeah. that, that lead them to aggression. And, and no, aggression would be having a particular source as a mm. response to a particular provocation or some kind of abuse. So, I so we need to be language like it. Yeah, I hear you. Can I give an opportunity to Elvis Kagamek his contribution? Uh, thank you. No, I, I, I think I wanted to, I, I just want to, there's a feedback. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. I first want to just to throw three or four terms without saying a thing about them. You know, there are terms like a social engineering, terms like uh, a defocusing, terms like a gender, uh, sorry, terms like agenda setting. And I, I'm not going to explain those terms, terms like uh, uh, discourse framing. I'm not going to explain them, but I'm going to leave them like that. But all I want to say is that if you were to uh, frame the discourse differently and then remove a, the, the adjective of gender-based from violence, and then you just talk about violence, you will then come to see that actually men... They are victims of violence by far, by far more than women. We just talk about violence more than women. Now, you will also, the, the, the reason for that is that a, actually men themselves, I think we need to put a finger on this, that men themselves are victims of violence from other men. So both men and women do face violence from men. And also when a woman is raped, when a woman is a victim of violence, we must also understand and say this openly, that when a woman is murdered, that woman is a mother of a man. That woman is a sister of a man. That woman is uh, a, 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 what? But, but it's a relative of a, uh, of a man. But I want to uh, leave it by saying that sometimes we get defocused and sometimes the, the, the agenda is set differently so that we don't look at other issues that a, 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 a I mean, gender-based violence itself is a subset of. For instance, do we talk more about race-based violence? Now, the, the violence that affects Black people because they are Black people and oppressed and landless. Do we talk about uh, that violence that happens on the farms because it affects Black people because they are Black people and landless? Do we talk about violence by the state against black people in particular, because they are black people. I, I want to leave it there. Thanks. Well, uh, that, thanks, that, thanks, Dalvis. Uh, let's allow, um, uh, is it Amachi uh, Kenneth to make his contribution? Uh, thank you very much, Chair, for the opportunity. Uh, yeah. Of course, uh, my, my contribution in a way is very much um, uh, connected to the last speaker, and yep. it's um, very much covered by what the last speaker said. But just what I wanted to say is that our, this, our conversation should also try to include um, the, the fact that uh, the, the, the issue of violence, that South Africa itself is a very, our society has become a very violent society. So we should look at how the root cause of violence in our society in the first place. And then it is within that context that then we can then incorporate the idea of 
other elements that also necessitates to violence being perpetrated by either men or women. So, but in a way, part of the conversation have been um, uh, been covered by the last, last speaker. So in a way, I didn't need to talk more, but thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity and for this uh, uh, conversation and discourse. Uh, 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 thank you, Akene. Um, uh, is it uh, Fariseni? Uh, you can understand uh, make a contribution. Fariseni, are you there? All right. Um, Dr. Tobijan, are you back and you've heard uh, the comments? Uh, you know, there are a couple of issues that are being uh, raised here. Uh, the issue of social engineering and the issue of, um, you know, defocusing, agenda setting, and, and discourse framing. Um, and, and Nelvis is raising the issue of violence being violence, irrespective of who perpetrates it. And, and gender-based violence as subservient to violence. And shouldn't we be looking at violence as violence even before we uh, you know, segregate it uh, to gender-based violence? And shouldn't we really look at how you know, society is engineered and, and begin perhaps a process of re-engineering uh, discourse? We need to re-engineer discourse so that we can begin to refocus the whole agenda towards violence, uh, you know, and, and look at it as violence, irrespective of who is the victim. Mm -hmm. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, can you hear me, sir? We can hear you, yes. Uh, yeah, um, uh, my apologies. Uh, I'm staying in, uh, in Limpopo. Most of you know the area quite well, so there are so yeah. many challenges. Uh, but you know, I will keep on coming in and out, uh, depending right. on the weather and uh, this internet service. Yeah, uh, I, I know that the uh, and thanks for the the, the points raised by and uh, Tate Nelvis uh, uh, because when you talk about uh, a revolutionary agenda, for instance, um, where you predate it to the to the 18th century and so on. Um, and in South Africa, you, you, we, we've had our own kind of struggle where we, we wanted to, to unseat uh, the apartheid status quo and uh, in its place, usher in an egalitarian society. Uh, this struggle was actually run by both, was actually, uh, you know, men and women were at the forefront of this struggle. Um, but then some, some uh, authors are saying that uh, during the struggle for emancipation, we've put the struggle for gender equality uh, in the back burner. We, we did not advocate for, 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 for the eradication of patriarchy, for instance, because patriarchy was another subset of an oppressive system that had to be addressed by our revolution. Unfortunately, in most of our manifestos, there was little talk of, uh, you know, patriarchal struggle. So, so, but moving forward to now, because we are in this neoliberal dispensation, uh, and we have seen an upsurge of, of violence against women, we cannot turn a blind eye and say, let us talk generally about violence and not look at the 90% of the people who are the victims. Uh, I think uh, we should be multi-pronged in our approach towards that kind of, uh, you know, the struggle for the emancipation of all, not only women. In a nutshell, that's, that's how I look at it. And I'm, I'm sure even uh, Dr. Amaechi uh, is saying that uh, violence in South Africa has increased. Uh, is he talking about violence against women or just violence generally? Uh, now, when you look at, uh, I think Dr. Seth Cooper has alluded to the psychological effects of colonialism and apartheid in, in some of your webinars, uh, Yeah. So, 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 so that uh, black people uh, are still you know, grappling with mental liberation. Uh, that is another side of struggle which we haven't won. Uh, we are scarred, we are a scarred nation 
uh, oppression, apartheid, colonialism, neo-colonialism has actually rendered us uh, effete to an extent that we cannot rise above and, 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 and claim that humanity that Africa used to have. So that is another revolution which probably Azapo and the other Black Consciousness Movement uh, adherents uh, should try to, to win. Uh, it's a struggle for the mind and uh, violence cannot be isolated from uh, our mindset. The psyche has been destroyed by, by colonialism and all that. Yeah, no, that's fine. Dr. Amayeshi, you want to come back? Sorry, sorry, Chair. I, I was out for a few minutes, so I, I lost the track of the conversation. So I didn't know so, so I'm sorry, no, no. please speak. Go on. So I just saw that I needed to unmute, but I was just out for a few minutes. So I didn't actually. No, 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 that's okay. That's okay. Um, I have a couple of comments here. Um, Nandabe Koyawa is, is saying, you know, this discussion has to do with how you know, society is, is socialized and how we are taught in our homes. Our minds um, you know, are easy to indoctrinate and it starts, when, uh, it starts from when, um, or it, it starts from when young, when parents may be strict and uh, reinforced in schools that we may use discipline that is harsh. Modern society is influenced greatly by the colonial mentality and the colonial system. And the prof is right that the capital system needs to be overhauled. And um, uh, maybe it comes back to say, well, can we agree that the stats that are available might also be problematic in the sense that the violence done to men has not been recorded or documented. And the stats might also not be a true reflection as many men are dying inside, taking into consideration uh, the underreporting. Um, uh, Dr. Abayechi, given the nature of our society, is it really possible to have a discussion of gender-based violence that does not take, uh, or that does not make women as the victims? And uh, yes, I have missed uh, you know, part of Prof's discussion due to unstable internet connection on my side over and above physical violence. There is also economic and psychological abuse and violence that may be perpetrated against other, against the other spouse, be it female or male. And uh, non Police also let men go when women report their men for assault because of their, their affinity to men. Women have been mobilized to the extent that their cases are now at the forefront. Gender-based violence is to do with inadequacies and insecurities in both men and women. We need their consciousness to build our confidence and acknowledge our identity as equals in our society and instilling positive images. Of, um, of each other. And that violence takes uh, various forms, psychological, physical, and emotional, which needs to be taken into, into consideration. And, um, I, you know, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Amaichi is saying, well, he worries that the discussion on gender-based violence in South Africa is ignoring the root cause of, of, of violence. And yes, um, Zwan Tiletuan is saying uh, that he thinks the challenge is that women were previously disadvantaged, hence this notion of gender-based violence against women. I'm not too sure about, about this notion of being previously disadvantaged. Where is the advantage now? <laughs> we, we, you know, I have heard of this, uh, you know, previously disadvantaged communities and previously disadvantaged people, and as though we are, we are more advantaged. The fact that we are talking this violence, it means we are still um, you know, disadvantage in some way. And I don't yes. know where it is. It, maybe the advantage is in our ability to be able to discuss about it and report it. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Prof, your comments? Mm, yeah, uh, I, I, I fully agree with you. We, we are still a disadvantaged society. Uh, when, when you look at the, uh, I, I think the neoliberal setup has given us some false sense of liberation. Uh, and uh, people now are talking about the previously this and previously that. Uh, when you look on the ground, uh, the disparities between the rich and poor escalate on a daily basis. And uh, unfortunately, 
it is black people who are at the receiving end in this instance. And uh, now when we look at women, they are also at the receiving end. Uh, and and, and some, some feminists are saying that uh, they are talking about a triple, is it a triple form of oppression being that of class, uh, race, and also of gender. And, mm. and gender as, as, as a, yeah, when you look at patriarchy and its manifestations and, and how consumer capitalism has actually strengthened uh, 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 the binaries and so on. So, so it is still an ongoing struggle, like you said. Uh, let, is, let, let us not talk of the former. Well, unless you belong to a neoliberal school of thought where you see a progressive constitution as a magic wand to, to solve problems of the society. Uh, we all live in, in, in townships and uh, villages and so on. We know the squalid conditions our women find themselves in. Poverty is hitting them on a daily basis. They go and get chop wood in the, in the bush to make fire, to fend for the babies and so on. And uh, they carry families. And, and now you have this other variable of a man who, who comes in uh, and, and, and thinks that he's the boss of the family and so on. And as a result, gender-based violence just erupts from there. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, people like uh, maybe uh, Angels and Karl Marx and even Steve Biko who have bisected uh, societal problems will tell you that this is an ongoing revolution. It's not only about women getting emancipation, but it's about the overhauling of the system of, of patriarchal capitalism. I still repeat that. Uh, it will take uh, so many years, probably so many decades, but at the core of it, the curriculum that we are giving to our kids uh, is not favorable for, for any egalitarian ideals, unfortunately. So we have yeah. to start at, uh, at the schools, make sure that we give our children the right education that will change the society and the way we think about ourselves, first as black, secondly as women, and thirdly as a society. Mm -hmm. No, no, thanks, uh, 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 Dr. Tuvejan. What I'm interested in right now is, um, I hear you saying we need to engage in discourse. We need to, uh, you know, put this discussion at the forefront of, uh, you know, the country's, um, you know, um, uh, policymakers and uh, begin to think differently in terms of our policy framework. Yes. That's well and good. But how do you advise, you know, that gentleman who is suffering in the now and who goes to the police station and says, well, I am being battered. I am suffering. What do I do? I, no one cares to listen to what I'm saying. And when I speak to the headman, I am laughed at. When I speak to you know, the police station, you know, the captain laughs at me. When I, I go out and speak to my friends, I am being ridiculed as not many enough. How do we advise those men who are suffering from the battering and from the gender-based violence? You know, and should we allow them to remain muted and should we allow them to suffer in silence? Um, yeah, well, well, and part of the research that we made uh, was to make exactly that, to sort of valorize the voices of those men who were muted. And uh, at the University of Venda, where I'm working now, uh, we do have programs, we do have campaigns. Uh, unfortunately, they are limited to where, we, where the university is where situated. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And uh, because these men have, have shown us that uh, we really have to do something about uh, their experiences uh, at home. So, and some of the findings from, from the research that, that we have done, uh, I, I mean, the, the fact that, uh, you know, it, 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 it runs so deep, 
very deep to an extent that uh, uh, some of the men were separated from their children because uh, their wives reported them to be abusers and all that, only to find that uh, nothing of that sort happened. So, so it's like a woman here crying victim when actually it is the man who has been victimized at, at, at home. We've had you know, men who were cheated on because they did not have the resources. Uh, and uh, some of these participants would indicate that uh, money was at uh, you know, the root cause. Uh, if some of them were unemployed and their women would just go out and fend for themselves, have multiple partners and so on and so forth. And to an extent that they would take matters into their own hands and, and, and maybe uh, have a physical fight. But mm. now what, what should we do about it? That's a very big question. Uh, constant campaigning, we have, we have political parties. Now it is time for electioneering. Uh, they campaign almost every day. Uh, uh, we, we, we should also include in our campaigns uh, the issue of those muted men who would love to be liberated also. That's the first thing. The second thing, uh, in our lectures, I'm a lecturer also, I'm talking constantly to my students about the sensitivities of gender-based violence and that we should not only limit it to women. Let's open it up and make sure that uh, our, our colleagues, our male colleagues uh, are heard, their voices are valorized out there. Mm. And what about the, the, the whole aspect of colonial mentality? Because I think the you know, colonial uh, oppression uh, is at the genesis of the problem that we are dealing with. And if we were to, for instance, allow you know, these muted men to at least um, obtain psychological liberation, that would then enable them to you know, fight confidently you know, the scourge of violence that is meted against them. Would that not uh, be, you know, amongst a, a basket of solutions or a first in the basket of solutions that you prescribe? Yes, that would be uh, one of the other uh, solutions out there. But where does it start? I think it doesn't start. It, it, well, it starts in the family. It goes back to our educational system uh, because uh, when I first started talking, uh, I alluded to the fact that uh, uh, Ngujiwa Thiongo has put gender-based violence at the doorstep of, of colonialism. Because with colonialism came slavery, uh, oppression, and all those other forms. And so the, the, the personality, we have split personalities. Uh, at the same time, we we have Western civilization in Africa that compounds the problems even more. We don't know where to, to start. So now with the advent of slavery, you, you had people uh, uh, whose mentality has been that they are inferior and that they can unleash all sorts of venom and, and uh, you know, hatred uh, to one of their kind. In this instance, it would be maybe black people. So, so you are right, mental colonialism goes deeper, but it takes some sort of education to decolonize the mind, to make sure that we all aspire to be one, we value humanity, we value ourselves, and uh, we make sure that we live in a free society, no, no, not, not a, a new apartheid society that we live in now. Mm -hmm. And then from the investigation that you've conducted, um, what has been the impact on children? When, when you, you hear, you know, these men coming to you saying, you know, we have been suffering from, you know, this violence uh, for prolonged periods of time, uh, have you taken the time to assess the situation, you know, within the family? and more especially the impact on you know, the kids and as, as they grow up, how do they respond to um, you know, this violence? And what 
do they grow up to be uh, in you know as as they grow older? Mm. Yeah, maybe you are leading us to another research, <laughs> and thanks for bringing that up, because we uh, uh, that was part of our D. We call it a D limitation. We we only concentrated on that specific cohort, men who are suffering in silence. Uh, but as to the effects of that silence on the children, mm. that that will be a very interesting study because we know that uh, uh, that kind of muted violence uh, causes dysfunctionality in families. And then, you know, children as a result may not even cope well at school because when they come back home, they find, they find tension and all that. So it would be a very uh, good study uh, that we may have to, to look at. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Okay. Um, David, you wanted to ask something? David, you are on the floor. If you can just unmute. Uh, sorry, I made a mistake. I didn't want to say something. <laughs> no, that's that's okay. And, and I think related to this, um, Zwandile is asking the question, how do we make sure that we teach our kids, particularly boys, on how to be responsible, respectful of women at an early age? And uh, he's asking this because, you know, we tend not to allow our kids to play with young girls with a fear that it might have an effect on them and not be a real men when they grow up. And I suspect it is related to, um, you know, uh, what, what you are saying as a follow-on study that uh, it, it becomes important that you, you think about uh, investigating the impact of, uh, you know, these muted men and, uh, you know, the violence that is emitted, you know, at them, um, the resultant impact and effect of that on, on the young ones. Comrade uh, Tovejan. Oh. I, I, I thought it was directed to that day, David. Um, but yeah, yeah, of course, we. I'm just going to generally talk about the uh, the, the program uh, because I'm within the Institute for Gender and Youth Studies. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we have so many students doing research on various topics uh, related to gender-based violence and uh, uh, the issues that you are, you are raising now. Um, uh, it, it can be another topic that probably you can set up uh, for another hour or so, so, so that we can incorporate a lot of people who can talk about that. But, but uh, be that as it may, we, we know that violence in itself uh, begets dysfunctionality in, in, in many families. And uh, as a result, a lot of students a lot of children who come from dysfunctional families where there is violence, they tend not to, to cope very well uh, at school. And that, that brings that cycle itself where children drop out and uh, as a result, you know, the level of illiteracy and the lack of education in our society. So, so that's one other area which we can, we can delve into uh, uh, to, to study it in that. All right. Um, as, as we conclude, um, uh, Comrade Nervis is uh, commenting that the, ne the neoliberal discourse is so in charge of discourse framing that it has centered gender-based violence and pushed all other principal issues of the struggle to the margins. And that is the defocusing you were talking about. And the result is that, you know, the gender war between Black women and Black men highlighted uh, such that they forget that they are faced with a common plight of uh, white supremacy, poverty, and all other social ills caused by colonialism, racism, and capitalism. And maybe as, um, as you uh, reflect on that, uh, you can also give us your closing uh, uh, comments. Oh, yes, I, I fully agree with uh, uh, that day in the follow and uh, That's like Emma. Oh, that's not a I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. 
uh, 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 because we, we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that uh, our struggle is ongoing. Uh, I've said that before. Uh, and uh, uh, my take on this is that uh, if the policies of, of, of Hazapo, for instance, uh, I've read some of the economic policies that the organization has uh, taken up uh, by way of uh, continuing with our struggle against uh, racial capitalism, the struggle against patriarchal capitalism and uh, consumerism in, 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 in South Africa, and uh, probably the ushering in of a socialist uh, uh, state may negate issues of, of patriarchy and, uh, uh, and consumerism and all that. Uh, it, it's just my, my thinking, and I fully agree with Within that NF. But at the same, be that as it may, violence by uh, in, in, in all its manifestations has to be fought. Uh, you know, it can be violence against men or violence against women. Uh, uh, we also need to increase our, our fight against uh, because it's a pandemic, yes, but we know the serious pandemic is, is that of, of, of landlessness and uh, poverty and uh, Black oppression and all that. So, 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 uh, uh, our struggle has to be uh, multi-pronged so that we can we can win at the end of the day. Mm. Uh, thanks, uh, Doctor Tswane uh, Ditobejani. That was a very interesting uh, conversation that we had. And what is clear to me is that um, you know we have to engage in this multi-pronged struggle. And uh, we have to really reframe and, uh, uh, you know, the discourse around gender-based violence for people to understand that it is a subset of uh, a struggle against colonialism. It is a subset of a struggle against colonialism, and yes. it is also a struggle against sexism. Um, because I mean, for us to be able to move forward, we really need to understand what it means to be anti-sexist in the struggle and what it means to fight for, for true, liber true liberation. And that true liberation will then lead us uh, to being uh, better human beings in the long run. Thank you for spending the afternoon with us and thank you for the conversations and thank you for your contributions. Uh, well appreciated. Uh, I look forward to engaging you this time next week and thank you and goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the lively conversation. Being deprived, being oppressed